play a game this morning, all right? We're going we're gonna to play a game, and I want to know if you know these people. So I'm going to show you some pictures of some people. I want to know if you know them, and here's how I'm going to know if you know them. If you tell me their name, then I know you know them. Are you with me? All right, here we go. Who is this person? So there are some people in here who know LeBron, all right? I want to get to know you after this morning, all right? The next one? Daniel Radcliffe, poor guy, will forever be known as Harry Potter, right? But that's okay. It earned him millions of dollars, so I'm sure he's okay with that. Popu. Oh, some of you know, all right? Oh, more people know Dolly than they know the Pope. All right, we're headed in the right direction this morning. One more. How do you know? Because it looks like Sunday School Jesus that you've seen all over the walls of the churches that you grew up in, right? So here's my question really this morning. Do you really know LeBron or you just know of LeBron? Like, is there anybody in here who really knows the Pope? Because if you do, like, I really want to get to know you, okay? Or do you just know of the Pope? Anybody in here that really knows Dolly Parton, or do you just know of Dolly Parton? Here's my question. Do you really know Jesus, or do you just know of Jesus? The Bible talks to us about three turning points of getting to know Jesus of knowing God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we call these turning points in the Bible baptisms. And baptisms means immersions. And so these are three ways that we immerse ourselves into knowing Jesus. Three, three ways we immerse ourselves or baptize ourselves into knowing God. And I want to walk us through these three ways this morning. So it's baptism of salvation baptism by water, and baptism in the Holy Spirit. These are the ways we take our next step of knowing God. Let's we'll start with baptism of salvation, all right? So I want you to go back to this Sunday school picture or this Sunday school image of Jesus, all right? And I want you to take a look at this, and I want you to know that when I was growing up, there would be a week in the summer that my younger brother and I would get to go spend the entire week with our grandparents. We called them Papa and Mama. And for a whole week, and, and you know, back in that day, they didn't call it grandparent camp or Grammy camp or Mama camp or whatever. But let's be honest, that's really not what it is anyway, right? It's parent respite camp. That's what it is, right? Of course, parents, you know that after they've been to grandma camp for a week, you have to take the next week, straighten them back out, right? That's how it works. But we would get to go and spend a week with Mama and Papa, and in the room where my brother and I stayed, there was an image that looked very much like this. It was not exactly like this, but it looked very much like this. And I'll never forget when we were little, every time we went and spent the week with Mama, we would ask her to tell us this story. And she would always tell us the story about Jesus and how he's the shepherd and, and he had these sheep and, and there was a hundred sheep and one of them began to get lost or, or wander away and Jesus would leave the 99 and he would go and he would chase down the one. He would go and he would find the one and, and he would grab the one up and in the picture she had hanging on the wall in that bedroom where we would stay, he would take the lamb and put it over his shoulders and he would carry the lamb back to the 99, back into the flock or back into our entire fold and she would tell us that story every single year. Luke chapter 15 verse 7. Jesus says, I tell you, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one who repent and return than over 99 who don't need to repent and return. That's where it's at, church. In fact, Jesus said a few chapters later that he came to seek and to save the lost. The one, to be running after the one. That's what it's all about. That's what the church is all about. That's what we should be doing is we should be chasing after those who are lost, those that have wandered away, those that are not in the fold. That is the very mission of the church. Listen, we can put a mission statement up on the church all day long. We, we can follow it. We can go by it. Listen, the church does not have a mission. The mission has a church. That is the church's mission. 
to be after the one. In fact, in context there in Luke chapter 15, this is not the only story that Jesus tells about something being lost. He tells a story about a woman who lost a coin and she is searching frantically all over the house, turning everything upside down and cleaning and trying to find this one lost coin because she wants to find it so desperately. And then he tells the story of a lost son. Sometimes we refer to it as the prodigal son, the younger son who comes to the father and says, look, I don't want to wait until you die. I want my inheritance now, so just give it to me. And, and the father gave it to him. The son goes off. Scripture tells us he squandered it. I know a little bit about that. He squandered all of it. He ended up in the pig pen, literally in the pig pen, like eating what the pigs ate. Have you ever seen what pigs eat? That's where he was. And I love it in Luke chapter 15. The Bible tells us that he came to his senses. And he says, look, even the servants that work for my father have it better than I do right now. And so I'm going to get up out of this pig pen and I'm going to return home to my father. And I, I'm going to beg to become one of his servants. I don't deserve to be his son anymore. But at least I can be a servant and have it better than I have it now. He got up out of the pig pen. He went back home. Scripture tells us that when the father saw him, he ran. He ran out to him, and before the son could even begin to apologize and explain and say, I'm sorry, and I just want to be your servant, he, he put the robe on his son, and he put a ring on his finger. All of that signified that he was his son, that he was even more than his son. And he said, look, throw a party. Come on, let's have a party. Bring, bring the fatted calf. Let's have, we need to celebrate because this son of mine was lost. But now he's found. Listen. There's a word in there for somebody today. Listen. You're trying to earn the Father's love. You're trying to earn your way back. You realize you were lost. You realize that, that you are not part of the fold, but you've been trying to, to be good enough or to do enough good things or to be in church enough, and you've been working for it. And you need to hear this morning, you don't have to work for it. All you have to say is, Father. All you have to do is say, I believe Jesus is who he says he is. And when you do that, that is the baptism of salvation. That is the immersion of knowing Jesus. And when you say that, you know what he does? He picks you up. And he holds you. He throws a ring on your finger and puts a robe around your shoulders and says, let's throw a party. You know what? There's more rejoicing in heaven over one who was lost and returns home than 99 that were there all along. Oh, yeah, see, because in the story of the prodigal son or the lost son, there's also an older brother. The older brother is the 99, and the older brother got a little upset that all of this was happening for the younger son who went and blew all of his father's inheritance, comes back and now his father's throwing him a party? What in the world? Come on, church, we get that, don't we? And some of us need to hear that word today. There will be more rejoicing over the one than over the 99. You know why? Because the 99 were eventually, were, were, were at one time the one. You get that? When I was growing up, when I was going into my freshman year of high school, you know, because this was like a, a ride of passage, right? Like from eighth grade to, to, to ninth grade. Like back then we was like from being a boy to being a man, right? That's how we looked at it. And so before we were going to be a, a ninth grader in high school, my friends, we got together and, and a couple of days before school started back, we decided that we were going to camp out in the country. Now listen, I grew up in a small town, right? I mean, I graduated with 24 people. So even the people who lived in town lived in the country. You get it? We were country people. But this night, we were really out in the country, like out in the cotton field. Uh, my, my friend lived out in, in a cotton field. We were, we were even away from his house out in the cotton field. The only light out there was the light of the moon. I kid you not. It was dark. We were in a tent. We were having a great time. Listen, this, this, I'm not even going to tell you when it was, but here's what I know. Our parents could not track us on Life 360. Nobody knew where we were at, okay? For those of you who are teenagers in the room or listening, we, we had to use these things called flashlights. They're a little tube-like thing. You have to unscrew it, put batteries in. Like, it wasn't just, we, phone, we didn't even have a phone, right? 
We, we were out in a tent out in the middle of nowhere, out in the cotton field. It was so dark. But some of my friends had older brothers, and, and, and the older brothers got wind that we were out there, and, and they were seniors, and so they thought they would come and haze, not haze us, they thought they would come and play a trick on us, Right? And so they came out to the tent and they began to start doing things to scare us. Now listen, I'm not going to sit here. I'm, I'm, I'm much past being a freshman in high school right now, so I'm just going to tell you we peed our pants, all right? We were scared to death. But, but also as having a rite of passage of going into high school, like growing up in the country, like we all carried pocket knives, right? And so as freshman boys would do, man, we, we pulled those pocket knives out of our pocket and we were going after whoever it was. And the pocket knife I had, was a knife that my father had just gifted me. And it was a pocket knife that belonged to his father, my papa, the one who lived in that house that had the picture of Jesus and the little lamb and all of that. He had passed away when I was in fifth grade. So my, my parents, my dad, inherited a lot of his sentimental things. This was one of the sentimental things. And as that transition of moving from junior high to high school, my dad thought it was time for me to be gifted with this sentimental, important, very special knife. And so he gave it to me. And that's the knife I pulled out of my pocket that night and went running after those seniors out there in the middle of that cotton field with no light. And do you know what happened? Somewhere along the way, I lost that knife. Man, I was panicked. I was so upset. I was so, it was sentimental to me too, but listen, I was worried that when I got back home, my dad was not going to put a robe around my shoulders and a ring on my finger and throw a party for me because I had lost something that was so special. I looked for it all night in the dark. When the sun came up, my friends and I, we went back out there the next morning. We looked and we looked and we looked and we never found it. I knew I had to go home and tell my dad I had lost that knife. And when I got home and told him I had lost that knife, listen, I'm not going to lie to you. It took me two days to get up the courage to tell him I'd done it. When I did it, I don't remember exactly how his response went, but it was something like, it's okay. I can tell you're really, really upset about this, and I can tell that that knife was really, really special to you. And I know that you looked and looked and looked and looked, and it's okay. Listen, I never found that knife, but that's not the part of the story I want you to hear. Here's what I want you to hear. I want you to hear that when you're lost, and you say yes to Jesus, when you're thinking about saying yes to Jesus, he doesn't say, how could you? What were you thinking? How many times have I thought Jesus, there's this other image of Jesus with his hands sticking out like this, right? I don't know if you've seen this image of Jesus. It's a, lot of, it's a real popular image. And every time I see that image of Jesus, I just picture him saying to me, what were you thinking, right? That's bad theology. That's not what Jesus does. He never says, what were you thinking? How could you do that? How did you wander so far away? Here's what he says. In fact, he doesn't say anything. He runs. And he says, throw a party. Man, there's going to be rejoicing because this one has come home. When you take that step to know God, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. It says we are baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. When you say yes to Jesus, when you come home, when you take that step to not just know about Jesus or of Jesus, but to know Jesus, you are baptized into his body, into the church. You become the 99 who should be doing nothing other than going after the one. Think about this for a second, because I know the audience I'm talking to this morning. Many of you would consider yourselves to be in the 99. Who was responsible for bringing you in to the 99? I've been doing this for a long time, and when I talk to people, there's always another person or two or three that have been instrumental into introducing you into a relationship with Jesus. Who is that? Man, if you can today, here's what I encourage you to do. Pick up your phone, because you can do that these days. And call them and tell them thank you. Send them a text message. Send them a handwritten letter. 
who are you responsible for bringing in? I mean, let's not fool ourselves. Jesus is ultimately responsible. But who have you helped introduce to the step of not just knowing of Jesus, but knowing Jesus. You see, one of, our, one of our core values here at Aldersgate is found people, find people. And that is the first turning point. In fact, you can't even get to turning point two and three until you get to the turning point, the immersion, the baptism of knowing Jesus. When you do, there's a second turning point or a second immersion, a second baptism. We call it baptism by water. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was baptized by water. He set an example for us. You can find it in Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, John chapter 1. Jesus was baptized. He didn't have to be baptized, right? But he, he came to John the Baptist to baptize him, and John the Baptist said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. He did it as an example for us. In fact, then Jesus commanded that we baptize and be baptized. Matthew chapter 28, uh, John uh, chapter 3, Mark chapter 16. And Jesus tells us to, to go and baptize, to, to by water baptize other people. Why? Well, I want to share just two reasons this morning, all right? Number one is because it's a symbol of our commitment to Jesus. It's a symbol of our commitment to God. It's a symbol of our relationship with him so that, that other people know that we, yeah, we, we, we know not just of Jesus, but we know Jesus, and we want everyone to know that we know Jesus, right? It, it's like this, this ring on my finger. 27 years ago, right, Amy slid this ring on my finger, and she said, with all that I have and with all that I am, I honor you. And for 22 years, she's done that, all right? No, I'm just joking. I'm kidding. You guys know Amy, all right? And, and here's the thing about this ring, like, I wear this ring. I've worn it for 27 years. For, for one, it's a little harder to get off now than it used to be. But for two, I want people to know that I'm married. I want people to know about my commitment to Amy. I want people to know about the vow I took with her because in that way, it honors her. You see? That's why I wear it. That's why it's important for me. And it, it tells where. Now, listen, if, I've, if I were to take this ring off, am I still married? This is not a trick question. Let's try it again. <laughs> if I take this ring off, am I still married? But it tells everyone else that I'm married. So you can still know Jesus and not be water baptized. You familiar with the thief on the cross? There were two of them on either side of Jesus. One of them started saying, Jesus, you said you could save yourself. Hey, can you save us too? And the other one said, don't you get it? We deserve to die for what we've done. This man has done nothing. And at that moment, he walked into what? The immersion of baptism by salvation. In fact, Jesus said to him today, you will spend eternity in paradise with me. See, get this. Baptism by salvation, that is required to go to heaven. That is required to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus forever. Baptism by water is not. However, it tells the world that we not just know of Jesus, we know Jesus. And here's the second thing I want to share with you about that. I've had the opportunity and the privilege to baptize a lot of people, and I can tell you that there's never been a ho-hum baptism. Why? Because baptism by water is a holy sacrament. A means of grace by which we use a very ordinary symbol of water, but a way in which God shows up in very supernatural ways. I've seen people that, that are so overcome they can't speak. I, I've seen people that never show emotion want to hug me. And I'm like, what in the world? I've seen all these responses to baptism because it's a very holy, sacred moment. And when you are immersed into the water and come up here, here's what you're saying. Man, I, I am dying to the old and I'm being raised to the new. Just like Jesus, right? I recognize 
that Jesus has picked me up, put me on his shoulders, and carried me into the fold. I've been baptized by salvation, baptized by water. And the last one I want to visit with us this morning about is baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, Liz, I, I grew up in a religious tradition where uh, the teaching was, or what I used to think, was that this happened simultaneously. When you were baptized in water, you were also baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that that is not the case. But what I am saying is there are at least four instances in the Bible where it's not the case. In fact, I'll refer you to Acts. In Acts chapter 8, Philip has an engagement with the Samaritans, and, and, and they're, they're baptized by salvation. They're baptized in water, and then there's a separate baptism in the Holy Spirit. You can read another chapter, Acts chapter 9, and, and there you get the, the story of Saul becoming Paul, and his experience is the same. And then if you go into Acts chapter 9, you get the story of Peter and, and, and Cornelius. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10, you get the story of Peter and Cornelius, and, and it's the same thing. And then if you go into Acts chapter 19, you get Paul and the Ephesians. It's the same thing. Let me just share with you uh, from Acts chapter 8 this morning the story of Philip and the Samaritans. And I'm, I'm going to read starting in verse uh, 12. It says, But when they believed Philip, so Philip shared the story of Jesus with the Samaritans, and when they believed Philip, what baptism is that? What turning point? What immersion is that? Baptism by salvation. They believed. They said yes to Jesus, right? But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That word there is baptism by water. Okay? They, so there was this baptism of salvation, baptism by water. But now look what happens if you skip down to verse 14. Now when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive who? The Holy Spirit. It was a separate turning point. It was a separate immersion. It was a separate baptism. And this happens on at least four occasions in the Bible. Baptism by salvation assures you eternity in heaven with Jesus forever. Baptism by water is a symbol, a sacrament, a holy moment where God becomes real and tells the whole world you don't know of Jesus, but you know Jesus. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is needed to live the abundant life that Jesus died to give you. You see, you can be baptized by salvation, you can be baptized by water, and you can still miss the abundant life here on this earth that God has for you. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you to experience the abundant life that Jesus has for you. Here's the good news. It's not just available to some, it's available to everybody. Oh, wait, 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 let me say that again. He is not just available to some. He is available to all. How? Can I just, oh man, I wish I could preach on this for a long time this morning, but just two things, all right? Number one, <laughs> ask. Just ask. Ask. James says we don't have because we don't ask. Ask for the Holy Spirit to give you the power to live the abundant life that Jesus wants you to live. In fact, Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. What father among you, if his son asked for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Have you fathers ever done that? No, you've wanted to, but have you really ever done that, right? Or, if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, I love how Jesus says this, right? It's almost like, what? But then he turns it, listen. If then you, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give? And he just didn't say good gifts, watch what he said. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That God would give you everything you need to live the abundant life he has for you. Can I share one more thing with you about it? And Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, be filled 
with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's an interesting uh, turn here with that verb feel. I see like in the English language, we have three tenses for verbs, right? Past, present, future. In, in the Greek language, they, they have way too many tenses for verbs, right? And, and this tense, this be filled, this tense is the present tense in the Greek language. But it means more than just what's happening right now. In the present tense, in the Greek verb, what the word means to be filled, it means to be filled and 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 to be filled. It's a continuous action. It means to constantly and continually be filled. It just doesn't happen one time. We're to be filled over and over and over and over. Here's what that means based on what we just learned. We're to ask over and over and over and over and over. Every day we should make it a habit that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's why we should do that every day. Because the other thing that happens in this verb in the Greek, it's just not present tense that says, hey, this happens over and over and over. It's imperative. You know what imperative means? It means Paul's commanding it. It's not, it's not Paul saying, hey, um, if you'd really like to have the abundant life that God has for you, then this is what you should do. It's not that tone at all. Paul's saying, do this. Continually ask. Oh, the other thing about the verb, its tone is passive. <laughs> Which is really important because here's what that means. It means you cannot manufacture the power of the Holy Spirit. All you can do is receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So my question for us this morning is do you know of Jesus or do you know Jesus? Where are, you, where are you at with those three turning points? Uh, have you been baptized by salvation? Like, have you just heard of Jesus? Maybe you've sat in church all your life. You know of Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. Maybe it's because you've been striving, trying to earn his grace and love. Maybe it's because you've been judgmental of those who Jesus picks up, carries on his shoulders, and brings them into the church. Have you, have you been baptized by water? Have you taken that step of immersion, that, that turning point? Have you, have you been obedient to Christ's command to, to be water baptized? Have you taken that step? As far as we know, everyone in the New Testament, with the exception of the thief on the cross, because it was kind of impossible, was baptized by water. And man, have you realized the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. Have you asked for it? Do you ask for it on a daily basis? And live in the abundance that he has for you in the here and the now. I want you to just close your eyes and I want you to ask God to speak to you about where you're at in those three immersions, those three turning points, those three baptisms. And I'm going to pray with you. When I say with you, I, I want you to pray, okay? Listen, if you've never taken the step of baptism by salvation, and God's tugging at your heart today, you can see Jesus chasing after you with that reckless love, leaving the 99 to follow after you. All you have to do is say yes. He will pick you up. And there will be a party in heaven. If that's the step you need to take today, would you ask for that step? Take that step right now. Maybe you've never taken the step of obedience to water by bapt uh, uh, baptism by water and you want to take that step and you want to make that commitment to Christ in the here and now, right here today. And maybe you've taken that step of being baptized by salvation. You've even been water baptized, but you've never really realized the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Listen to me. You can leave here today with the power of the Holy Spirit. And all you have to do 
is ask. As you're praying, I'm going to ask you to do three things. Number one, if you're taking the step of baptism by salvation, I want you to, I want you to pull out your phone, your tablet, or whatever right now, and I want you to go to aldersgate.online slash Baptist, uh, slash salvation. It'll, it'll be on the screen for you. Aldersgate.online slash salvation. And let us know you want to take that step. If you've never been water baptized and you want to be obedient to that step, then you take out your phone or your tablet right now and you go to aldersgate.online slash baptism. And let us know. And then if you're in this room this morning, if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, everybody's eyes should still be closed. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. God, I thank you for the hands that are up. I thank you for their courage to ask. And God, we know that you tell us that when we ask, we will receive because this is a good motive. God, we know that you're a good, good father and you give us the Holy Spirit when we ask. And so God, we thank you for that and we pray for an infilling, the power, the abundant life that the Holy Spirit can bring. God, we want to walk out of this place today, not just knowing of, but knowing 